abreast of Crash.net for all the very latest. Of course, not that you need telling that. And it will be a busy weekend. Let's look forward to it then, shall we? Uh, Magello. Um, and it's going to be quite a monumental weekend, actually. Uh, and Valentino Rossi uh, back, well, in number form. The number 46, Keith, uh, is set to be retired this weekend, officially. Yeah, he'll be there. It will be the um, just before qualifying on Saturday. So anybody that wants to tune in and um, you know have a look at Valentino at Mugello, which who doesn't? I mean, it's the scene of so many fantastic Valentino. Yeah, you know, what did he win? Something like seven consecutive MotoGP races, I think it was that he won. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think when it was eight, but I think it was seven that he won uh, across from Honda. He won a couple on Honda and the rest on Yamahas. Mugello. Even though Misano really is his home track because he's only down the road at Tavulia, um, Mugello is the Italian Grand Prix. It has the title of Italian Grand Prix. And that whole bank, you know, going up the hill from San Donato and then those flip-flops up, up to Luca and the like, um, covered in yellow. I mean, you, you go back to the times of fighting with Biaggi and, and, and that, that, you know, it's just... They had to have armed guards there. I mean, Rossi mania at Mugello had got so out of control that they had to actually put the the local, you know, dad's army out to, to try and keep everybody in place because it was just nuts. And you can understand why. I mean, a complete legend. Something like, did he do something like 27 years? I think it was. He had his first international win at Mugello um, back in the 125 days. You know, like the history of Valentino and Mugello are, are just, you know, entwined together. It's what a bloke. And the 46 will be retired just before qualifying on Saturday. And we'll all tune in and, and probably have a little bit of a tear in our eye regarding Valentino. I mean, there's no track invasion like a Valentino Rossi track invasion ever. Not, not everyone agrees with retiring numbers, of course. Uh, I know some people have mixed opinions about it. We've seen it. But, I mean, if you're going to retire numbers, you've got to retire the most famous of them all, haven't you, in, in two-wheel sport? Rossi himself said, I remember back in 2016, it, he actually wasn't that keen on his number being retired back then. But, I mean, now it's a, it's a big brand, isn't it, the VR46 thing? And, you know, we've seen Casey Stoner's number, 27, Marcus Simoncelli, Kevin Schwantz, Nicky Hayden. So, you know, we've seen other numbers retired, let's say. So whatever you think about it, if you're going to retire them, you've got to retire the 46, haven't you, really? So some people are a bit cynical saying, oh, you know, this announcement came out only a week or so ago at Le Mans. And is it because ticket sales were a bit low? This, of course, being the first Italian Grand Prix without Rossi, isn't it? And everyone's a bit unsure. As he's saying, he's had such a long history at this track. He's missed races. He missed the 2010 race when he got injured there. But, you know, this is the first Italian Grand Prix since he's actually left the sport. So I think people will just be looking to see what effect that has. You've got to believe that there'll be plenty of fans in the, on the hillsides, as Keith says, and uh, he'll be getting plenty of support all the same, even though he's no longer racing. It was quite sad that we finished on in 2021, really, with with you know with the end of the pandemic, with you know the trackside didn't have the same atmosphere as it would have had. Jason De Pasquier was killed in qualifying uh, that weekend as well, so it was a, a real cloud over Mugello last year, which was of course Rossi's last Mugello. So um, as a racer, so it was it was quite a you know well it wasn't quite a sad event. It was a massively sad event. I think everybody felt Jason's loss hugely and uh, and it was quite raw and it was the weekend obviously that he valentino uh, made the announcement that he was retiring at the end of the year so it was a momentous 2021 uh, this year i think we're looking forward to a cracking race that's for certain and uh, it will be full again it certainly will be i think it will be an emotional weekend uh, for, for many reasons you touched there keith though on on some of those moments uh, around Mugello with, with rossi and his italian uh, glory days can we dive a bit more into that and your favorite moments uh from rossi and at Mugello? nice biaggi moments to remember i think that if you've never been to Mugello, even without rossi you should go and imagine what it's like it is absolutely unbelievable ferrari owned the track <laughs> formula one formula one seemed to have only just found out how good Mugello is when they couldn't go anywhere else. I don't know what's the matter with you, like Harry. I really don't. It's a great um, racetrack. I, I asked myself um, the same question. <laughs> where else? Can, where else can you stand at the track side? It's, it's like a a valley that you're you're going you know along each side of it and then down in the middle of it. It's incredible amphitheater that that is just riotous. Um, two hundred and twenty-five mile an hour, 
because you're coming onto the front straight fairly quickly. The braking point is just on the top of a hill, if you like. So the first corner, San Donato, is, is an incredible spectacle. It really is something a bit special. 225 mile an hour, those bikes are moving some air around them at that. Rossi, you can't beat a Rossi type situation. And of all the Rossi jewels, it's always Biaggi that's in my mind. I mean, Biaggi, that, that kind of very near hatred um, that they both had for each other. I think it was respect, but I'm not sure. It was a kind of that hatred slash respect type situation. So it must be like 2005 when they had their, their duel there as well. I mean, there have been other times where, you know, Alvaro Batista, when he took um, Rossi out that time, you, you think to yourself, <clears throat> this man is not going to get out of here without a helicopter and an armed guard. <laughs> um, Mugello itself has this tiny little service road that comes out of Scar- Scarperia that's up the road. Um, and you, you can't get in or out of it. It's full of people walking. It's like a, a mile and a half, two miles of walking people. You can be there for five hours trying to get out of the track in the evening. Um, doesn't matter how smart you are or how many, um, we've all got routes through fields and dirt tracks and everything worked out. I just had my, my route worked out to the little caravan bar that's just outside the track. And that's where I stop <laughs> until, <laughs> until it starts to subside a little bit. But, um, I I love that part of Tuscany as well because there are all those kind of hillside tracks and things where you can go through fields and and, and quite often you find that your track is blocked by somebody who's bloody had the temerity to go and plant it that year Uh, whereas the year before it wasn't cropped or anything like that Um, and you you try and stay in a hotel that's got a dirt track to it through through fields and woodlands and you, you work out what fences are padlocked and which ones haven't this sounds extreme but it's actually true and you always make sure that whoever's in your car who's traveling with you is a bit of an expert when it comes to a sat nav, because it's not just about following uh, major roads. Obviously, you've got to have someone who can read an ordnance survey map. So you actually, <laughs> what you need is a co-driver, really, when you're getting out of Mugello. Um, so it is a, it's, it's a hell of a place. And I, I mean, I, Mugello is my number one. There is no doubt about it. And Valentino Rossi at Mugello, you know, racing some of his, you know, people like Biaggi, um, they are just imprinted on your memory. But to have seven consecutive years of winning at the top level, at the top class, pretty spectacular. We're going to miss him. <laughs> Certainly will. And, and as you're saying, Keith, winning on those different bikes, wasn't it? That was a, he, he just always seemed to rise to the occasion, wasn't it? It didn't matter whether it was a 990 Honda, 990 Yamaha, 800C. Well, even in 06, when it was such a, you know, the, the bike, he struggled with and then he turns up at Mugello and it would this force of nature would would propel it around the track and uh, I think just to give one sort of non let's say result based highlight I think it's that 2008 helmet where he had the face stuck on the top yeah the scream <laughs> that, that's very good <laughs> that's, that's a sc- someone screenshot that immediately I'm not going to pull the face that he had when he rode the Ducati there because that, that was no fairy tale that didn't work <laughs> but that's completely the other way <laughs> Well, I mean, some some fantastic uh, memories. I've just um, googled Magello weather for this weekend. Wet and it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, all raining. Yeah, it happens Ooh. at Magello sometimes. It does, and uh, and many a race. I mean, I think Valentino has been in a situation where he's he's kind of crashed a few times when he's been in contention for podiums. It is a difficult place when it goes that way as well. I mean, it's. Um, it gets used a lot too. So uh, car guys, you know, it is a Ferrari test track, as I said earlier. Um, so, you know, might have had a bit more Formula One interest since you guys have had Formula One there a, a few times now. Discovered what a great place it is. I tell you what, Mugello in a Formula One car must just about be flat, apart from the start and probably turn one, I would think. Because <laughs> it is, it's so fast and flowing that with all that aero and all that rubber stuck to the floor, I should think Formula One guys must get around there about 10 seconds, 15 seconds quicker than we can. It was a brilliant. I mean, it was a COVID. It came as a COVID uh, security track, didn't it? But it, it was brilliant racing. One of the best races, actually. It's a shame it's not not on the calendar um, uh, at the moment. And then you found Portimao uh, as well. You, you yeah. Bloody, you, as long as you don't start destroying our tracks with your downforce and bloody braking points, we don't mind. <laughs> well, that, we just had the Spanish Grand Prix, and you guys that hold that turn uh, ten now has all been reprofiled for the bloody bikes. So uh, it's yeah. nice, it's a well, nice let me tell you something now. about that then. The turn 10 was reprofiled because you bloody stuck a, 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 a 
a chicane in between 12 and 13. You stuck a 12 and 13, you know, why would you do that? Oh. I mean, you stuck that chicane in there, and because the chicane was so close to 10, we couldn't move the barrier back at 10 because they met in the middle. Yeah, now, if there yeah. was no chicane there, if there was no Formula 1 chicane there, then 10 could have been made safe. And the original turn 10 at Catalonia was absolutely brilliant. So don't you give me any of that about you bloody car blokes. All you're interested in is bottom gear corners because that's the only thing you need is a DRS. You make a fair point. And I do, I think I agree that chicane, I don't know why, I don't know why it's there for, it doesn't provide anything for, for overtaking in, in, in Formula One at least. But anyway, that's for uh, another time, I think. I think we should do our predictions for this weekend um, and uh, and try and, well, get them correct. It's Keith leading the way at the moment. We've all got points, thankfully though. Uh, last year, uh, Quartararo on pole, Took the win, head of Oliveira, Joanne Mir. What are you feeling, Keith, this year around, this time around? Well, I don't think it's going to be anything like that. I've got Bagnaya for a win. Um, Ooh, straight in, okay. Yeah, I think Bagnaya for me. Bagnaya on a Ducati at Mugello, just. I think he's going to raise, raise, his, raise his game for that one. Yeah, but the rest is really, really, really <laughs> tricky. Bagnaya, I'm going to go for a Ducati 1-2. Miller, okay. Quattararo third. Okay, Bagnaya, Miller, Quattararo. Pete, what you got? I'm going to go Ducati 1-2 as well, Ooh. but I'm going to go for another blue bike versus red bike. And uh, I'm going to go Bastianini no. and first. <laughs> I've got to say, when will someone sponsor that bike? You know, yeah. this team is, is still without a title sponsor. And I, I mean, I've said, no, I've said to you guys off air, but if I was Ducati, I would step in and I'd have that bike red, uh, at least until someone steps in as a sponsor. Because at the moment, we are seeing a blue bike <laughs> battling with a red bike. And I think just for marketing purposes, if there was two red bikes up there, and let's out oh, in Piro, of course, he'll have a wild card almost certainly mm. this weekend on the third factory bike. So there will be three factory bikes. But I just think... Bastianini, he's a factory contracted rider already, as most of the Ducati riders are. Someone step in, get his get his get his bike sponsored, or at least have it in Ducati red. Because until then, we're seeing a blue versus red battle, and that's what I think will happen. I'm, I'll go Bastianini, Bagnaia second, and I'll go Quattararo third. We've seen the Yamaha. You, you've thrown a curveball with the weather there, Harry. I have to mm. say, so all of this might be rubbish, but we have seen the Yamaha do well at Mugello. It's of course got this the, the fastest straight of the year. But there's a lot of corners in between, you know, the start and end of that straight. And we've seen in the past that Lorenzo has been very successful there. Quattararo won last year after Banyaya fell on lap two. Um, so it, it's the sort of, sort of track where, yeah, I think Yamaha can do well. They should have the new aero package this weekend. Probably a bit less downforce. Might help a bit on the straights. We'll have to see. But uh, that's who I'm going with. Okay. I'm going to copy you. Bastianini. I want him for the win. Ahead of Banyaya. Uh, and I do think that the Bastianini bike with, with the Crash.net MotoGP logo at the front, I think that would look rather good. <laughs> Our faces on the back, listen to the podcast on the side. I think that would work quite nicely. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to pitch that to the team. Um, <laughs> and third, I mean, I mean, Quattararo would be, I feel like I just need to go for a different option just because. So I'm going to go for the man on the mission. Um, can't sign a deal right now, but the most podiums at the moment i'm gonna put alicia spargo in third again and that because that came true last time around and I, i'm i'm all about alicia at the moment he's my man if i can't have eka laquona i'll have alicia spargo <laughs> <laughs> so that's my top three so bastiani banya alicia spargo pete bastiani banya quattararo and keith banya miller and quattararo well not long to wait at all. It is MotoGP race week. It all gets underway uh, in just a few days time. I will leave it there, chaps. Uh, but make sure you're tuned in across Crash.net for all the latest news and analysis throughout the week. And then we'll be back with you next week, of course, to look back at all the action. Get your questions in, leave them in the comments section or tweet Instagram or Facebook us. Just search Crash MotoGP. Please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts and we shall see you right back here next week. Bye-bye. 